Well, good morning. And thank you very much for inviting me here to talk to you today at ADB about this very important topic. And um, to continue what I think of as a global conversation about LGBT issues, about issues related to uh, full participation and inclusion of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. I think it's important to remember to break those apart every now and then, the, the LGBT acronym. Now, most of the time when we have this conversation, uh, we've been talking about it in the context of human rights, thinking hard about the, the impact of stigma and how it often leads to violence or discrimination against LGBT people around the world and how that violates our, our various commitments to, to full human rights uh, for everyone everywhere. And uh, that is a very important conversation that's happening in many places. But increasingly, we are now starting to think about this uh, beyond the LGBT person and his or her rights, but to thinking about this as also an economic issue, as an issue of economic development. And that conversation has begun in places like the World Bank, the UN Development Program, USAID and other bilateral donors. Um, the Inter-American Development Bank is having that conversation. And so that's what I'm here to talk to you with, uh, to have this conversation together uh, about this issue. What is it that makes uh, LGBT issues a potential economic development issue? And basically, it's because stigma and exclusion of LGBT people hurt us all in the context of our larger economy and how well it works and provides for each of us. Now, I want to start off by um, just kind of giving a little basic discussion about what we know about stigma in different countries. And by stigma, what I mean is negative attitudes about LGBT people and the sense of inferiority with which LGBT people are sometimes treated. We have some pretty good data from uh, a, several different international surveys that have um, some relevance for you all here at ADB. Now, this is a... a a survey done in 2013 by the Pew Research Center in the US, and they uh, interviewed people all over the world. And don't, you don't have to squint to look at this. This is just going to be very impressionistic. So the question was, should society accept homosexuality, yes or no? Now, the green bars on the right are the percentage of people who say yes, and the orange bars on the left are the percentage who say no. So you can just get a, an immediate sense across these these different regions, where North America and Europe, mostly those green bars are pretty far to the right. Uh, in the Middle East, mostly it's the opposite pattern. Mostly the, the orange bars extend pretty far towards the left. There's very little acceptance, um, social acceptance of homosexuality. In the Asia Pacific region and in Latin America, there's a lot more diversity. There are some countries that are very accepting, where people are very accepting, and others where they're not. I want to just zoom in on the Asia Pacific region and show you uh, what that looks like. So actually, the Philippines, where we are today, obviously, and Australia are countries that appear to be fairly accepting on this particular measure. Um, almost uh, three quarters of people in the Philippines even uh, believe that society should be accepting of homosexuality, and about half of people in Japan. Now, when we get to South Korea, China, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Pakistan, you can see that those orange bars start to look bigger and bigger. But there, so there is some variation, and that's what makes this, um, this conversation so uh, interesting and sometimes very challenging. So there is some evidence that, that, the, that stigma varies uh, from this particular kind of question. And let me just also say that we don't have any really good international data that compares uh, people's opinions about transgender people or about gender identity. So this is all, uh, this first part is really just focusing on uh, really just homosexuality. Here's another survey, the World Values Survey, which some of you may have heard of. Now, they, this is a, a long-term effort over several decades, and they, ask, they give people a, a list of groups, uh, mostly kind of stigmatized groups, and they say, which of these groups would you not want to be neighbors with? Somebody from those groups. So this is, uh, let me interpret this for you. So high numbers here mean less accepting. It means more people don't want homosexual neighbors because homosexual is the, is the group that I'm going to zero in on here. So uh, in, uh, those top bars basically are Malaysia and China who have the most in the region, most people in the region who say they would not want to have a homosexual neighbor. 
Although it's interesting that that's declining, right? So, but it's still more than half of people in those countries say that in the most recent version in 2010 and 2014. So from there, as we go down where people are, again, becoming more accepting of homosexual neighbors. So Taiwan is in the middle, uh, and then we have Thailand and Singapore just below that. And the Philippines actually has the, the lowest percentages of people who uh, would not want to have homosexuals as neighbors. So actually it's interesting, more evidence that in the region, the Philippines is actually fairly, uh, fairly accepting. So that's two ways of thinking about it. One very direct, but kind of global, should society accept homosexuality? One now being much more about social interactions, would you want to have a homosexual neighbor? And let me just give you one uh, third way of thinking about this, which is from the moral perspective. And here the story gets more complicated. So the Pew, Center, Pew Research Center has also done surveys around the world asking about uh, whether people believe certain kinds of groups or activities are morally unacceptable. Um, and here we see that in the Philippines, 65% of people say it's morally unacceptable. Interesting contrast, right? Highly accepting on some kinds of perspectives, but not on the moral perspective. The US, I threw in here just as a comparison, uh, only 37% of people in the US believe that it's morally unacceptable, but I can tell you that that is not an opinion that people have held for a long time. That 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 has shrunk over time um, and fairly recently. Um, so uh, so this, this ambivalence about homosexuality, depending on how we're looking at it, is something that, uh, that is clear in other countries. And another interesting context is they also ask about things like abortion and divorce. And actually, people in the Philippines think those are even more morally unacceptable than homosexuality. So it's, you know, it's a general kind of cultural um, uh, a uh, set of values that, that does not um, include uh, moral acceptability of homosexuality. So I offer this to you just for a variety of reasons. One, to kind of show a little bit about where we are, that there is stigma, and that it varies across countries. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure that someday some researcher will show that some of that variation across countries is partly because of, of institutions like ADB taking stands. It's partly because of people who are activists and advocates for these issues organizing and making a difference. And, uh, uh, and uh, so we will see how that turns out. That's a, that'll be 10 years from now. I'll come back and talk to you about that. Um, but what I want to turn to now is, uh, given this evidence that there is stigma embedded in pretty much all of our countries, what does that mean for LGBT people? And I'm going to think about this on a variety of levels. Um, I'm going to start with what I call the ground level uh, people, like you and me. Um, what is the impact on LGBT people? Secondly, what's the impact on businesses that uh, are in a particular country? And then I'm going to zoom up to what I call the 10,000 foot level to take a look at some studies that have tried to estimate what the economic cost is of, um, of uh, homophobia and transphobia on a, on a country's economy. And that will also include as a final layer a uh, cross-national comparison. So let's just uh, dive into this. Now what sorts of effects does stigma and exclusion have? Well, we have a very huge literature, uh, some from academia, some from uh, civil society organizations, and some from uh, places like uh, the World Bank and UNDP increasingly has been doing research on this issue, um, that show that uh, that kind of stigma has an impact on LGBT people's lives. It can result in violence against them personally. In countries where homosexuality is criminalized, they may be put in prison. Um, sort of on the, on the econ uh, more obviously economic end of things, people can lose their jobs, they may get lower wages, they may be excluded from, um, from their families, they may face harassment in school that limit their educational opportunities, and they may face you know, pressure to marry within society someone that they would rather not marry when they would want to marry someone of the same sex. There are a wide variety of kinds of impacts of, of stigma that, um, that we see in, um, in a wide variety of literature. And in fact, last week, I was at uh, the conference of the International Lesbian and Gay Association where I heard some, um, a researcher from UNDP presenting research from a study of China, Thailand, and the Philippines, and uh, finding uh, a great deal of evidence in workplace experiences of individuals in those three countries 
of, of poor treatment and of uh, facing limited opportunities, job loss, and um, uh, so that will be coming out sometime next year, so that will actually be some, some additional useful data for, for folks here in this region. So what happens when people experience those obviously personal, uh, personally bad outcomes? Well, I would argue that we can map those onto a set of economic um, outcomes, like having less education, being less productive in the workplace, um, having lower earnings and perhaps and in many situations we have evidence that people face more uh, more poverty. They have poorer health and shorter lives as a result of this kind of treatment and uh, sometimes lower labor force participation. So a wide range of things that just probably looks very familiar to you if you work at a place like ADB. Though many of these are connected to the sustainable development goals, the millennium development goals, the um, the kinds of programming that development banks do, trying to, uh, to create more inclusive economies in many different places. So these are getting very clearly into the realm of economics. Um, but it starts with the individual level. Um, I'm gonna then, I'm gonna now sort of push this out a little bit farther. So again, we've got individual uh, poor treatment because of being LGBT, and now we've got the economic outcomes for individuals. Now let's take a look at what those might mean for the overall economy affecting everybody. Um, so we may have higher health care and social program costs. We may have lower economic output. Um, over time, as people face barriers to getting education, it becomes more costly to get an education. What happens? People are less likely to get it, and this sets up potentially bad dynamics, economic dynamics that will have long-term effects, not just even in the short run. So these are just a few examples that I think we can uh, start to see a little bit of evidence for in some different kinds of data that I want to talk about now. I'm going to focus, first of all, on that other ground level group of employers. Now employers um, care a lot about uh, many of these things, but in particular, they care about how productive their workers are. And they know that if their workers are less productive, their businesses are going to have lower output, and that's a bad thing, right? That's more costly, less profitable. So let's move on to the employer level. And I'm going to first just kind of let them speak for themselves. Um, when you talk to multinational companies, um, as I've, I've done actually here in the Philippines and many places all over the world, they actually tell a very consistent story. And in their words, the discriminatory laws or actions can impede business efforts to recruit, hire, and retain the best workers in an environment that enables them to perform at their best. So it's not just me, you know, kind of your, your local economist kind of standing up here telling you that these things are bad for the economy, but businesses themselves are taking steps to be more inclusive because they know that their workforce is their most valuable asset. And all those companies that, uh, that flashed up there on the screen have literally signed on to this. This language actually comes from a brief that went to the US Supreme Court around marriage equality. And the list of employers that, that uh, signed this have only increased over time, this, this kind of statement. So businesses themselves say, we care about inclusion of LGBT people because it affects our bottom line. I will just also say, businesses do care about the human rights side as well too. They do believe in equality and equal treatment. But what's really driving the change that's happening in, in these multinational corporations is that business case. Then research supports the business case. So some colleagues and I, a couple of years ago, tried to gather together all of the research that's been done on these questions, trying to connect how LGBT people are treated in the workplace to some kind of important workplace outcome. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of what this graph means, these are, these are basically numbers of studies that we found. So we found on that first line that 16 studies showed that LGBT people have greater job commitment when they work in a more LGBT positive environment. Um, four studies, the gray bar kind of in the middle there, means that the, the study didn't actually find a relationship uh, to job commitment. And the, the light blue bars on the far left are uh, kind of finding a negative effect. Um, so uh, what this is designed to do is to give you a sense of the weight of all of those studies. And the weight of all of these studies is that the outcomes are positive. So greater job commitment, improved health outcomes, better job satisfaction, 
uh, more openness about being LGBT, which by the way, I, uh, you could, should have some psychologists or public health people come and tell you about how important the ability to be open is for LGBT people. Um, but going back to that list, sort of improved workplace relationships, less discrimination, and increased productivity. These are all the things that employers say they're looking for. These are all the things that researchers are saying we see in data that we are collecting. So there's a very strong business case in the data for the idea that uh, inclusion is good for the economy. So let's now move out a little bit farther and think about uh, the country level. Um, a couple of uh, here, I'm going to tell you about a study that I did where I was able to try to actually put some dollar values on some of these things, on lower pro the, the impact of lower productivity, the impact of poorer health, the impact of lower labor force participation. And I did this uh, for the World Bank. I was hired uh, to create a model of the cost of LGBT exclusion with a focus in this particular case on India. And um, I showed how you can actually come up with estimates of this. Um, if you've got evidence that, uh, as, as we have in India, that there is lost productivity caused by discrimination in the workplace, that, um, that family constraints on lesbian and bisexual women in particular may, uh, may restrict their choices of labor force participation that will have feedback effects on their earnings and ability to um, to contribute to the larger economy. And then the cost of health disparities. And in India, I was able to find some very good evidence that there are disparities in HIV prevalence, in depression, major depression, and in uh, suicide risk. Um, so the model in the paper that I would be very happy to send to you, and maybe that's something that you could also post if you're interested, is, um, is kind of a how-to to do that. Now, I did not actually, in that paper, come up with the numbers, so I thought, I could do that. How could I come up with the numbers? And when I plugged in um, some of the uh, actual data into that model, what I found was, as a rough estimate, that the Indian economy is losing somewhere between 0.1% and 1.4% of its GDP because of the exclusion of LGBT people. 0.1% to 1.4% of GDP. Now, that doesn't look like a very big number. But I can tell you that if overnight uh, the Philippines economy or the US economy or the Indian economy had a drop of 1% of its GDP, we would call that a recession, right? We'd be very concerned about that. So exclusion kind of puts uh, us into a permanent sort of uh, recession in a sense. We're really not able to realize the full capacity of the economy because we're holding people back from what they could do. We're holding people back from getting the education that they could use, from being as productive in the workplace as they could be, from having good health to, to make those economic contributions. So I was here uh, about 16 months ago or so and gave some talks outlining some of this research and some people said, hmm, could you do that for the Philippines? And I thought, well, maybe I could. So I, had, I came back home and I had a student who was interested in looking at this um, and so she went out and, and tried to find some of the same kinds of data that I used in India to see if we could come up with an estimate for the Philippines. So I'm going to give you a sense of what that might look like. I'm going to call this a sketch, not a full model, not an actual set of findings to cite. So please don't you know, cite this all over the place. But just to give you a sense that the, the same order of magnitude may be happening in a, in a country like the one that we're in today. I drew upon some research done by a psychologist at the University of the Philippines, Eric Manalastis, and uh, who's um, looked at some, um, some health data on young adults here in the Philippines, the Young Adults Fertility and Sexuality Survey, and um, that it gave me some pieces that I needed to have to try to estimate uh, two things. Basically, what's the cost to an individual of, um, of uh, of discrimination, and for that actually I did draw on some international research that shows that on average about um, uh, that LGB men and women would uh, earn about 10% more if they were free from discrimination, free from constraints on their labor force participation. And then I took 
uh, Professor Manolastis' figures of, uh, that estimated that about 3% of young Filipino young men reported a same-sex attraction. He's told me he's done more recent research that shows similar uh, figures for young women. And um, use that as a rough estimate, 3% of what the LGBT population might be like. There's, you know, a lot of debate about that, about that, um, that figure, and I'm not going to take a strong stand on 3% being the actual number, but I need a number. And it's always between, you know, in the other countries that have pretty good data, somewhere in the 1% to 5% range. So 3%, sort of right in the middle there. And created an estimate of how many LGBT people are in the workforce, divided those together, uh, sorry, multiply those together and came up with a total of about $254 million. So this is where the numbers start looking bigger. Um, what about health disparities? Uh, we found some um, evidence that uh, the prevalence of HIV for uh, men who have sex with men is are about three times roughly uh, the population prevalence rate. Um, so what would happen if we got rid of stigma and discrimination. Uh, those are things that we know hold back prevention and treatment and testing of HIV. So if we got rid of stigma and exclusion, um, let's say, let's just imagine, this is a hypothetical, that that rate got cut in half. So we're gonna have a sense, we're gonna be able to estimate about how many people won't have HIV who, who have it now, who wouldn't have it if we got rid of stigma and exclusion. The second thing we found some data for, this is also from Professor Manolastis' survey, uh, or study, had to do with suicide risk. So in the Philippines population, there are about 2.9 suicides per 100,000 people in every year. So how much more likely is it that LGBT people are, are, are committing suicide? Well, we used uh, the Manolastis figure that showed that suicide ideation, thinking about committing suicide, is about twice as likely for the young same-sex attracted men in his, um, in his survey. So let's say that, that the overall rate for all LGBT people is also about twice that of non-LGBT people. So we can again sort of think, what happens if we cut that down to the population level? What are the, who are the people who are still alive uh, if we can get rid of stigma and exclusion? So that gives us, you know, people that we can look at. Now the question is, you know, how do you turn that into an economic cost? And that's, you know, that's um, something we could talk for a long time about. But here's a, an approach that's often common taken um, in, um, in the research. There are uh, studies that show, that have tried to estimate for things like HIV and like suicide, how many years are lost. These are more formally called DALIs, Disability Adjusted Life Years. This is both in terms of actual years of life, but also quality of life measures that they convert to thinking about, you know, what's the, the, uh, what's the implied effect on, on uh, years of life lost. And then you can take those years of life lost and multiply those by, by GDP per capita to get an estimate of what those lives would have created had they still been there. And when you do that, you get an estimate of about $293 million. So let's add those up. And we're looking at about a half a billion dollars, US dollars. And that is about 0.2% of GDP. So it's very similar to the estimate. And this is all of the assumptions I made were on the conservative side. So it's designed to look like that low end of the, of the Indian estimate. So we can see that even just thinking about a few of these effects of, of stigma and exclusion can have very real and visible, potentially meaningful harms to our overall economy. So that's the looking at it from the country level. So now let's take our last view. So we're now up at the 35,000 foot level. And I want to tell you about a study that, uh, that's somewhat ongoing, but uh, I'll tell you about the first part that we did where we compared countries. We took 39 emerging economies, including several in Asia, and the Philippines was one of them. And we asked, you know, another way to think about what the contribution of inclusion to the economy might be is to, to get a measure of inclusion for each of those countries and compare it to GDP per capita. The measure of inclusion that we have, this is actually hard to get, but the me measure of inclusion we have is an index of legal rights that was created by one of our co-authors, a Dutch legal scholar named Kees Waldijk. And it measures eight different rights around criminalization of same-sex um, sexual activity, non-discrimination laws, whether families are accepted, and uh, created an index. 
And what we did was to compare it to GDP per capita. And let me just show you what that relationship looks like. It's basically what, what I would call a positive correlation between these two. So in this graph, what you see on the bottom is from zero to eight. That's the, the values of the index. That's basically just the number of positive rights that, LG, that, uh, that are related to homosexuality, actually. These particular ones, I'll talk about transgender rights in a second. Um, and on the vertical axis, we're looking at GDP per capita for these countries. We use data from the Penn World Tables, for those of you who know about that kind of thing, um, that sort of makes adjustments so that these are all comparable. And you can see a very clear positive relationship when you draw a line that best fits those points. This is saying that as countries have more rights, they tend to have on average higher GDP per capita. So that's the correlation. That's basically what that means. The nice thing about all this data is we have it going back uh, to the 1960s, actually. What we used for this study is the 1990s, and I'll tell you what that was in a second. We could not use data like that to look at transgender rights, but uh, Transgender Europe did a, a similar kind of study of rights for transgender people around the world, not as many countries and, not, but, and only for one year, but it was able to capture things like access to transition-related health care, being able to change documents to include one's gender identity. And again, so we created out of that, we created a transgender rights index. It's similar. It has 14 different rights. Um, and again, we found a very clear positive correlation for at least this one year. Um, so again, more transgender rights are correlated with, with higher levels of GDP per capita. Now, the last step was to say, we know that lots of things influence GDP per capita. It's not just inclusion and, and rights for, for minority groups. So we use the data to control for all the other kinds of things that we know matter, you know, levels of investment, the size of the population and labor force, the amount of trade, other, uh, other kinds of things that we can't measure. We use, for the, again, for those of you who know about these things, country level fixed effects and year fixed effects to take into account those things that are harder to measure. And we still found a positive correlation. And what that looks like is one additional right is associated with a $320 GDP per capita increase, which is about 3%. Let me be very clear, though. I'm not saying that if you pass a law, like your economy will immediately grow by 3%. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, but this is you know, probably a longer run effect that's been sort of gradually baked in. And it leads me to, uh, to, to come back to thinking about why these things are connected, to try to interpret what all of this really means. The, the model that I started with, where we looked at how exclusion holds people back, I would call that a human capital model. Uh, human capital are the skills, the knowledge, the experience that people develop that makes them uh, more productive. And, and if you're becoming more productive, you are increasing the economic potential, not just of your own earnings, but of the, the economy's capacity as well. Um, and I think the story that, that I was telling in the first part of the talk was saying, you know, here's how I think it works. When you have more LGBT inclusion, you get more human capital and a greater economic capacity, and that leads to more economic development. That leads to the higher GDP per capita. I have on here just an acknowledgement that there are lots of different ways of thinking about development. For instance, the capabilities approach that kind of uh, drives the UN's Human Development Index. Um, and there, you know, it's almost definitional, right? So inclusion um, uh, allows people to be and do what they want to be, which is the goal of the capabilities approach. And that sort of defines what economic development is supposed to look like. So we have a couple of ways of thinking about economic development where that causal link is really from inclusion to a stronger economy. There are other ways to think about it, though. S uh, political scientists in particular have offered a hypothesis that they call the post-materialist demand for human rights. The idea here is that as countries get richer, there's more openness over time to rights for individuals, we're thinking about individual autonomy, the loosening of traditions that might, um, that might limit certain groups, um, and that may allow for groups to form and lobby for rights um, in uh, legislation. So there, you know, richer economies get more rights. So that's a different kind of way of thinking about the causation. That uh, um, 
that we're still trying to sort out how we can actually um, separate those two pieces out because there, there's probably something to that. There is some evidence of that in uh, studies of attitudes about LGBT people. The last one that I'll just th put up here because I think it also links it in a different but kind of interesting way is a, an approach that I call strategic modernization. And that I think is something that we have seen that some people who have written about some Asian countries like Singapore have seen. Um, this is similar to the work of Richard Florida and the creative class, for those of you who might be familiar with that. The idea here is that countries you know, may want to improve economic development and do things to try to do that. And one way of doing that might be to, to uh, sort of change an image of what, uh, what the country is like as a, as a trading partner or as a tourist destination, for example. And maybe things like inclusion of LGBT people will enhance that. So it could enhance it very directly, like encouraging more LGBT tourists to come to a country. But it might also be, as Richard Florida would say, is that the tolerance for LGBT people is itself an indication that diversity is valued, that creative people are valued, and that that is also a lure for, for other people who may want to come and work in these countries. So there are lots of different ways of thinking about this, and we're still having this conversation and sorting out you know, which of these explain some of these correlations. But I think each of them makes sense on, on at least some level. And certainly this top one with the human capital and economic potential one has a lot of evidence at the, at the ground level for saying that that kind of effect exists. So I'm fairly um, uh, confident that even as we're able to tease these out, we'll still find that there is a, that there is a role in looking at these, these cross-country comparisons. Now, the question emerges. You know, let's say that we know this. Let's say that you know we we are convinced that there is some kind of link here. So, what are some of the next steps that uh, that might be taken? And I think that's really where the conversation is at this point. What does this mean for us? And I don't have those answers for you because it's really people like you in the audience who are the ones who are going to be coming up with that. But there are, uh, there, as I as I started out in the introduction, there definitely are efforts to try to figure out how to, to make those kinds of conversions. So you know, for UNDP, their efforts are around doing, a lot of it is doing more research and having convenings of, of LGBTI groups. And actually, I'll just say that I have not talked about intersex people. So you'll hear other versions of the acronym. It's not just LGB, now it's LGBT. Actually, now, inter increasingly internationally, it's LGBTI to add intersex people. Um, we don't have a lot of research yet on that. Um, but so UNDP is trying to do more research and to do these convenings. The World Bank also is thinking about research. They've actually had a couple of LGBT-related programs that have popped up in some of their, their development loans um, in some countries that have been interested in this. And actually, Latin America, there's a lot of interest in this. Um, and so that's one reason why the Inter-American Development Bank, I think, is also getting involved. I think they're mainly doing research at the moment or working on that. Um, and the, the these uh, development agencies that I mentioned here in these different countries, uh, some of them have become part of USAID's Global Development Partnership for LGBT rights. And that has involved uh, going out and doing trainings for civil society um, related to, uh, to owning and developing businesses, which I guess is something we'll probably hear more about in a few minutes. And um, uh, the, uh, the Victory Fund Institute, training people to run for office who are LGBT. And uh, you know, so these are some of the things that I think some ideas that are starting to pop up that we should that we should all be considering. And um, just to, to sum up, it's a matter that's not just for LGBT people. I think if anything, if I've convinced you of anything, I hope that's what it is. That this is something that we all have to care about, and we may all care about human rights for LGBT people. I hope we do, but by thinking about it from a development perspective, we've opened up a whole new kind of conversation that I think can lead to some pretty important advances for the, uh, the lives of LGBT people. So thank you very much.